I mean, witness to speak up about the one of it. And I thought, because all the other women are really stepping up and doing stuff now, and we've got a couple. Good evening. Um, so my name is Alejandra Scampini. I'm from Poder. I'm a Uruguayan feminist. Uh, Poder is an organization of 10 years working in Latin America um, in terms of advocacy and um, accountability of enterprises. And we are very thankful to UN Women for inviting us to be uh, moderating this very important session that uh, is at the heart of the work that we do in terms of analyzing development models and, and economic models. This is a panel uh, entitled The Crisis of Economic and Global Development Models and Their Impact on Women and Girls. And we uh, also have a special focus on COVID context. I would like uh, to make three remarks before starting this uh, amazing session. First of all, saying that this, um, that we see in Poder this equality forum uh, on, on gender, on equality, this equality forum like a, like a perfect storm, right? Because of these uh, three elements. One, this important focus on being a civil society centered space, uh, a global gathering that have started today with amounts of events and interaction uh, on a variety of issues from violence against women, technology, youth involvement, political participation, um, technologies, innovation uh, for gender equality. And so this is a very important uh, dimension. The second one is that this is a venue to remind ourselves of the commitments made in Beijing. And of course, that those made in 1995 uh, many of them are still unaccomplished and many, uh, many new challenges, but many new opportunities arise and we'll be talking about that today. And the third element I think is this moment in which the whole planet is discussing about, you know, recovery, economic, uh, social development issues, cultural issues, political issues in a very intersected way that we uh, we're not speaking like that back in 1995. So it's like a perfect storm of ideas and hopefully actions to uh, engage from a gender equality perspective in global debates uh, where you know many other uh, actors and stakeholders need to hear from the civil society movements, from the women's rights movement, what is to be done. So this panel uh, will be run uh, for two hours with uh, an amazing panel of uh, some of them are friends, long, long, uh, long time friends. And I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, Mariama Williams. She is the principal um, integrated policy research institute and director. She's a feminist economist that has uh, been, um, I, I remember one of these uh, first a feminist economist that prepared many of us on the trade and debt debate back in 1990s. So I would like to, to ask you, Mariama, uh, hope that you can hear me well. Can you say yes, hi? Yes, I can hear you well. Hi, Ali. <laughs> Thank you, Mariama. It's so long since we, since we last met. Um, I think it was in the forum, uh, in the anti-G20 forum, right? Mm -hmm. In the right. feminist well, yes, yes. <laughs> so many years and I, I wanted to also mark that that time because it was that time that also we went to the World Social Forum and, and um, many of us were marked by the assassination of Marielle Franco and the room in which we are all here today, this virtual room in which we are discussing political um, debates and, and experiences and projects are in a room named after her. Marielle Franco. So it's an honor, and I think it's a very nice way to honor her name and her work and her legacy by having a discussion on what's wrong with the development um, model, what's wrong with the economic model, uh, what's at stake for women's rights and, and livelihoods. And, and she, she was at the heart of many of those battles back in Brazil. And we are still, you know, uh, without any any uh, truth about who who killed her. But Mariama, you were part of that big movement, big momentums in which um, many of us, you know, were discussing what's G20, what's WTO. 
So now we are in a different moment. We are discussing the pandemic, but many of the issues that I'm sure you will tap on are related to things that the uh, feminist movements and feminist academia and economists, feminist economists have been saying for a while. So how the pandemic has unveiled things that we have been saying for so long. So Mariama, what you see are these new challenges? What, what is new about uh, this context of pandemia? And what are these challenges for, for in this model, in this economic and development model for activating gender equality? Hi, thank you very much. And I thank the organizers um, and all of the, the um, participants for this um, very amazing forum and very timely forum. Uh, it's, it's too bad that we cannot see each other and dialogue and look at each other and touch each other. Um, that's part of the one of the, the drama of the pandemics. But to get to your question, because I know I have a short time to, to, to do it, I think it's pretty hard to say what is really new, huh? because what the pandemic has done is to reveal a lot of what and put the spotlight on many of the things that feminists, economists and gender advocates have been arguing for years and years, right? Uh, many of the things that we've been arguing about, the challenges and opportunities that globalization purportedly present, that these weren't all grounded and they weren't sustainable, that in fact, women, yes, did get employment, but the, the sustainability of women's autonomy, these are all on these precipices that could shift at any moment with any kind of exogenous crisis, whether for our economies in the South or any kind of global, global dilemma. And I think what has happened is that the pandemic has really unmasked um, and shown the critical areas that we have care, uh, domestic work, the essential workers that are primarily women. Many of our economies are dependent, at, at least from where I am in my region, the Caribbean are dependent on tourism and that all of these things make our economies very unstable. So what we are seeing is the instability and the inequality underlying this nice picture that's presented often about globalization and trade liberalization. What's interesting now, or what's new, I would say, and it's, I don't think it's necessarily new, but is the rapidity with which government has had to take over much of the economy in many of our countries. Um, and many of the things that we were told could not be done because it, it would not be sending the right signals to capital and so forth. Governments have had to be doing those. And I think that those present some pointers for us in terms of opening up the discussion about what is the economy for, what are the dynamics of the economy and what the role of government is. And I think that opens up some really interesting things. The other thing is about the global value chain. Another area that we've been told that was a magic that was gonna incorporate and, and raise women's standard of living. We're seeing that the fragility of global value chain and the threat now of re, resurfacing these things but also what's new, I think, probably is the acceleration of technology, right? That we're all, our lives, our whole life, and the way we live, the way we work is now being um, accelerated by technology and technology communication, the surge in globalization of service. And I think what's also, what's not new, but it's accelerated is a hardening of migration policies around the world, right? So we see closing of borders that we thought were a thing of the past, those, those solidarity, even amongst countries, that is now frayed a lot. And, and um, even amongst developed countries, that kind of closing of borders without unilateral closing, without discussion. I think the fact that trade as contracted is something again, that we are not prepared to deal with. And we were not, we were told we could, that would not happen in globalization. So I think policy approaches are, have opened on many level because of the way that the pandemic has integrated the interconnectivity uh, among governments. Also the, the fact that we now are looking at, many different countries are talking about Green New Deal, which are on the fringe of economic policies. Up to a year ago, two years ago, we had one or two countries, we had UK talking a little bit about the labor talking, and we had the EU had a thing, but now we see many countries are talking about it. So a lot of the structural changes and the structural issues that feminists have identified 
are now foundation of what we should be recalibrating and balancing this whole idea. Now we have to, well, maybe the, the, the key difference is now, if we talk about efficiency versus productivity, now we talk about efficiency versus resilience, right? To what extent you, you create resilient economies that are sustainable, that actually meet the needs of men and women of their various dimension. And also the question about how do we reconstruct social contracts? So the neoliberal paradigm has spent almost 20 years destroying so the notion of social contract and the notion of what citizenship. So we went from citizens to stakeholders to a whole bunch of different things. And so we come back to those things. What are we as citizens? How do we cooperate with each other? How do we um, work? And in the context of the pandemic, we cannot forget climate change. For many economies, they're having this overlay of both the pandemic and climate change. So disaster relief and COVID relief, disaster recovery and COVID recovery, right? So all of those things are very important discussion. This morning, Karen going to talk about um, building forward. Again, that's a, a whole new thing that we have the opportunity now to restructure our economies along the lines of gender, sustainability, and people-centered. These were words in the Human Development Work Report. Uh, they were centered there, but they never made it into a macro policy. Now, if you listen carefully to central bankers and to others, you start hearing this about people-centered. Now, it still, could still be rhetoric, but at some level, I think the pandemic has really unearthed the underbelly of what this capitalist economy is and the various fragility and vulnerability. I will stop there because I think I'm way over my time. Thank you. No, it, it's okay, Mariama. I didn't want to stop you because you were rounding that, that idea. And, and so our next speaker, um, I, I, I don't have the pleasure to meet her in person. Um, so Sandra Kramer, if you are, if you can say hello, I think that it, it, it's, a, it's a very good way to walk into you know, the experience of Sandra Kramer. She's the chief executive director of uh, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women Alliance uh, in Australia. And I think that um, along the history, you know, if you allow me from Beijing till today, I think that we have, uh, we are still in, in debt with the movements that have, you know, the indigenous movement, women in indigenous movements that have, um, for a long time been at the margins of these debates and this question of sustainability, what do we mean by sustainability? And probably Sandra can, can talk to that. So the, the question to you, Sandra, is along the same lines of Mariama. Um, how, you know, what do you see as the main challenges for this current economic model and, and globalization of the world for, the, uh, for women in your region, in the, in the Pacific region? Thank you. Um, Warm greetings to you all. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the land and territories we are all on and speaking from today or watching this panel today. And I'd also like to thank uh, the UN Women uh, for inviting me here and as well as FEMI, the International, the Forum for International Indigenous Women for having me on the panel. I'm an advi uh, on the board of director for them. So what I'd like to talk about is as we know, the current economic model only rewards competition. So it's not based on the principles of any economic justice for us as Indigenous women. As such, the economic activities for us as in, in the Pacific for women, we have our traditional livelihood is our practices like weaving, traditional jewellery making and artwork and what and, and etc. But they are not competitive, competitive when taking into account the time and care that we put into making these goods as women in the Pacific. As a result, our time becomes undervalued and, and we also on the global market, so which results in exploitations of our labour or the inability of our goods then have to compete against the cheap, false goods produced by globalisations of our work from Indigenous women. Indigenous women's and peoples are one of the most affected by the adverse human rights impact of business activities in the context of the UN guiding principles, we are only viewed as one of the many business affected vulnerable groups. So for example, I work a lot out in the Pacific 
and here in Australia with women with their arts and craft, and they are being exploited daily. This is because we are one of the poorest people, yet we have the richest traditional knowledge, and this is why we are being exploited. The world wants our gifts and our artworks, but the greedy dealers will come and buy the women's work or make contacts with them for 1% or 2%. And I know this is happening because I've worked with Indigenous women who this is happening to. Those people and those greedy dealers can then make millions of dollars from their artworks or our crafts or jewellery. And yet our women either get nothing or their monies are held in trust at times and they still don't see it. The other issues that I found for, for, for some of our women, uh, Indigenous women, is and a barrier is that some of them face sexual harassment. They stay silent because they need the money. And some of them are already in contracts with some of these greedy dealers. So globally, half a billion people are expected to be reduced to poverty by the economic de depression caused by the COVID pandemic, as we know. And a larger proportion affected our Indigenous people. Meanwhile, the super wealthy and their companies don't buy their, pay their fair share of tax. Stock market holders' values increase by trillions of dollars. And in some cases, governments are conflicting, com intensifying this disparity between the rich and poor by bailing out corporations who go on to use those taxpayers' dollars to pay sizable, div 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 sizable amounts to wealthy shareholders rather than protecting jobs and conditions of us as Indigenous women or employers that work with them. And so, for example, here in Australia, we have seen our chief executives of some of these huge corporations take home large bonuses during the COVID. And in New Zealand, what has happened is that they've been crit criticised for immorally accepting government wage subs subsidies despite having retained earnings and profits, which they could use as a buffer against COVID economic impacts and despite paying out dividends to their shareholders. At levels which government have freely accepted nationalisation losses and privatisation gain in this way, putting business and industry demand before the nation, the needs of the nation's most marginalised and vulnerable po population. And this is as us as Indigenous women and communities. As we know, there are very few accountability requirements. And this has even surprised some of our corporate CEOs, but really they do know this. While there is talk of business and industry moving from a shareholder to stakeholder business, the move has been slow to practice itself. So what can we do better? We must build a compliance with already international agree high standards and these are well known. They're articulated in our human rights conventions and instruments states have signed up to and business industries are obliged to follow, such as we have the guiding principles on human rights and, on human rights and business, which contain three main pillars, protect, respect and remedies. These define concrete action steps for governments and companies to meet their respective duties and responsibilities to prevent the human rights abuses in companies' operation and provided remedies in, in such places as abuse, which take place all the time for our Indigenous women. Because as I studied, we are the traditional knowledge holders. We create so much craft and gifts around this world, yet abuse takes place. We are not receiving any remedies that are happening. We need the global Green New Deal or some other effective pr proposal for radical economic trans uh, transformation to support ambitious climate change. But for a global Green Deal to work, countries need to create new rules for international multi and corporations to address current problems which are worsening and which are also causing damage to environmental destructions. We as Indigenous women must continue to be a voice as a collective and FEMI, the organisation where I am from, as well as they are one of the groups that are on sitting at the UN table. They are working as a voice to make us included on the conversation 
FEMA are also providing knowledge and un uh, to understand the UN guiding principles to women out in the Pacific by running the programs that we have, the education programs, but we are not always at the table. We are still seen as invisible. We are continued to be, to be exploited and this exploitation will continue to be one of the biggest challenges for us as Indigenous women in the Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra, for also reminded us, reminding us that we are also in the year of the celebration of the UN guiding principles, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there are many groups, as FEMI, you know, discussing, you know, what, what is good, what are the opportunities, but also the limitations to really challenge the growing corporate abuse, all the things that you have mentioned about the growing and how it is um, in the pandemic. You know, the, the, the abuse of corporate is increasing and, and how, you know, at local level, the UNGPs can be reinforced by the experiences of indigenous, indigenous women at local level. Thank you very much. And, and Hayati uh, is, is our next speaker. Hayati Ghosh, uh, I don't know if you remember, but long, long time ago, we were under a different crisis in 2008. And you, you were one of the researchers uh, that worked uh, uh, with me and Cecilia Lemani to put together the impact of the women, of, of the crisis at that time on women's lives. This is a different crisis. And Hayati Ghosh is uh, uh, also an economist with vast experience, with lots of articles, with uh, many papers that are at the core of many of the things that UN Women and also ILO and other organizations are using to simulate um, new ideas, new actions. So Hayati, um, the question to you is similar and you are also you know, uh, in the middle of this debate, uh, taking advantage of what the other speakers have said, but um, you know, from your experience, from, you know, this privileged place that you also sometimes occupy in being in, in different uh, tables uh, at political level, global level. Um, what is, from that global experience that you have, uh, what, what are the, the, the current economic model uh, challenges No, And, and what, is, what, is, uh, what are the main debates today and how um, this can affect uh, advancing on uh, women's economic status. Thank you, Alejandra. It's really a pleasure to be back with you and to see old friends like Mariama again and be part of this very interesting and important discussion. You know, I want to pick up a little bit from what Mariama was talking about because I think one of the things that has been startling to me is how little has changed in some ways. I mean, Mariama is absolutely right that especially in the advanced countries, there is really a recognition that this model is broken and will not work. And there is massive state intervention. I mean, unprecedented and unbelievable really, because these are the same countries and the same politicians who last year would have told us, oh, this is impossible. It cannot happen and you cannot have this kind of fiscal spending. You cannot have this kind of support for, even for working people. So yes, in a developed world, it has happened it really has not happened to the same extent in the developing world. And that's a very big difference, which means that where you live now matters so much more than anything else in the pandemic. And it is one of the things which I would argue has dramatically increased inequality, not just between men and women, but also between women. The women who are living in the North, consider if a woman living in the US is getting the benefit of massive fiscal stimulus, 26% of GDP since uh, March, 2020. Massive monetary easing, reduction on, or you know, a removal of a significant proportion of debt, child support grants, a, a wonderful and amazing thing, uh, you know, and so on. Many, many different things which are very important and which finally there is some recognition of how important they are. Whereas a woman in a, even Mexico, is not getting the benefit of fiscal expansion, is not getting very much in terms of additional social protection or even compensation for the, the work that is lost or the incomes that are lost, not getting the benefit of greater public health spending. And if you go further afield, if you go to my own country, India, the government has spent less in real terms 
than it did in the pre-pandemic year. The government has reduced per capita health spending. And so we are getting, I think, extraordinary differences where the basic lessons that I thought would be evident to all, the importance of healthcare spending, the importance of recognizing the work done by women, the importance of ensuring public access to universal good quality services. None of this seems to have really registered in large parts of the developing world. And it hasn't been helped by the fact that increasingly internationalism seems to have taken a real backseat. Mm -hmm. it, it, everyone announces we're all in this together and no one is safe until everyone is safe, but it doesn't happen in practice. We've seen unseemly vaccine grabs by the rich nations. We've seen the rich country governments protecting intellectual property rights that are preventing the production of vaccines elsewhere in the world. We are seeing hardly any money go in terms of aid or you know, any kinds of benefits. Rich country governments are spending, as I said, you know, 20%, 25% of GDP on themselves and nothing in terms of any kinds of compensatory financing to the developing world. So I think these two have come as a bit of a shock to me. I did not expect it. I thought a, a, a pandemic of this proportion and which is so evidently something that doesn't respect visas and passports and all of that would make people realize that internationalism is the only way out. It hasn't. And as you mentioned, you know, we have no option but to look for internationalism to deal with all of our other major crises, the climate crisis, which is already upon us. So this pandemic has not made it happen yet. But if it doesn't happen soon, then I think we are really at the brink. We are at a verge of survival. And I mean, when you say, what does it mean for women's status? I think it's more than women's status. It is the very survival of the species, frankly, which is at stake. And so the kinds of things that feminists have been saying, people like Mariama and, and you and all of us have been saying for a very long time, these are more important than ever. But governments across the world do not seem to recognize that this is important for all governments. And I think that's a very major challenge. We have to think how we can seize this moment to actually change things. Hello, Alhanda, I finished. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Hayati. Uh, yeah, internationalism has not happened, uh, not yet. And hopefully, I think that from the lessons that we are hearing today from the different uh, members of movements, but also from the experiences so in some debates, I think that uh, we need to keep high our hopes high. And talking about that, I hope that Nicole Videgain who is uh, who has you know who is also a friend, and has also been for for long following these debates, uh, Beijing, Beijing reviews. Uh, Nicole has also uh, been in in feminist movements debates, world social forums, uh, feminist encuentros. But Nicole now sits at a, a clock, right? She is uh, part of the clock and. Um, she has recently been at the heart of the preparations of the uh, women regional consultation. So I would like Nicole to come into this discussion that is about challenges, that is about learning what has happened, you know, to women and women's rights in the context of COVID, but also bringing the, the lessons, the highlights from, from your work, right, at regional level in, in a CLAC. And also Nicole Videgain is Uruguayan, so she's also close uh, to our heart, to my heart. <laughs> Nicole, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Alejandra. Un gusto saludarlas a todas. Voy a hablar, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Um, saludos al gobierno de México, de Francia, bueno, mujeres, por organizar este debate y tenernos aquí discutiendo justamente cómo pensar una respuesta integral a los desafíos que son urgentes pero también se combinan con los desafíos emergentes y los estructurales. Y creo que a 26 años de Beijing, eh, un mensaje tiene que quedar muy claro y que tiene que ver con que los beneficios y los costos al proceso de globalización económica y financiera no se distribuyeron de forma equitativa entre países, entre regiones, entre hombres y mujeres, ni entre la diversidad de mujeres. Entonces hoy nos encuentra en un, en un mundo profundamente desigual 
con una crisis del multilateralismo en un momento donde, como bien decía tanto Yoyati como Mariama, lo que más precisamos es cooperación regional e internacional y solidaridad para poder reducir las asimetrías y generar un, un entorno macroeconómico propicio para la igualdad de género. En, en América Latina, eh, desde la CEPAL, nuestras reflexiones en realidad este, nos, nos sitúan en este contexto eh, desde, desde una visión que, que para nosotros es muy clara, que tenemos que, que decirlo claramente, que venimos de cuatro décadas de concentración de la riqueza en un modelo de desarrollo que, que está agotado, ¿no? que, que se asocia a un deterioro ambiental, a una precarización de las condiciones de vida de las mujeres, en sociedades que están signadas por el patriarcado, el racismo y una cultura del privilegio. Y es por eso que en CEPAL decimos que la desigualdad de género es un rasgo estructural de América Latina y está en la base de la insostenibilidad del modelo. Y se expresa, por ejemplo, cuando miramos la distribución desigual del poder, de los recursos, de la riqueza, del trabajo, pero sobre todo del tiempo. Y un año de, un año de la irrupción de la pandemia, lo que estamos viendo efectivamente es que se están profundizando los nudos estructurales de la desigualdad y está limitando la autonomía económica, la autonomía física y la autonomía en la toma de decisiones de las mujeres. En la región, además de, de, de suceder una gran contracción económica, de un 7,7% del PBI a nivel regional, esto ha generado más, un retroceso de más de una década en materia de participación laboral de las mujeres. Estamos actualmente frente a una salida masiva de las mujeres del mercado laboral, a un aumento de la informalidad y del desempleo, y que en realidad nos pone en una situación muy compleja para poder pensar una recuperación transformadora, porque estamos retrocediendo a pasos agigantados. Según nuestros cálculos, eh, 56,9% de las mujeres de América Latina y 54% de las mujeres del Caribe están empleadas en sectores con mayor riesgo en términos de pérdida de empleo y caída de ingresos, porque están concentradas por la segregación laboral en en sectores como el comercio, como el turismo, como bien comentaba María Manuel Caribe, la manufactura y principalmente en el trabajo doméstico remunerado. Y estamos proyectando que efectivamente 118 millones de mujeres de América Latina estarán en situación de pobreza y esto implica 23 millones eh, más que en 2019. Y por lo tanto, como en crisis anteriores, que ya las hemos estudiado y hemos estado en espacios de debate, las mujeres están amortiguando los efectos de esta crisis a través de una sobrecarga de trabajo doméstico y de cuidados no remunerados, un aumento del desempleo de la pobreza y una precarización de las condiciones de vida. Entonces en la CEPAL decimos que esto no es una época de crisis, sino una crisis de época, y estamos retomando los aportes de la economía feminista y los movimientos de la región para justamente hacer un llamado a avanzar hacia la justicia económica, climática y de género, y transitar a lo que estamos llamando una sociedad del cuidado, en la que cuidemos el planeta, a las personas, a quienes nos cuidan, pero también nos autocuidemos. Y esto implica una, repensar profundamente los patrones de producción, de consumo, de distribución, y reorientar, por ejemplo, las finanzas hacia la economía real, y poniendo en el centro la sostenibilidad de la vida. Entonces, en este contexto, lo que estamos llamando es para a, a avanzar hacia un nuevo pacto económico, fiscal, político y de género, y promover este, varios de los acuerdos que ya teníamos, tanto en la Agenda Regional de Género, aprobado por los países de la, de la región en la Conferencia Regional sobre la Mujer, pero también en la Plataforma de Acción de Beijing, que refiere a, a, a avanzar en una coherencia entre las políticas macroeconómicas, financieras, comerciales, productivas, y los derechos humanos de las mujeres. Para ello, efectivamente, en un mundo cada vez más interconectado, precisamos este, avanzar en una agenda renovada de multilateralismo, promover la cooperación regional y global, evitar este, la carrera a la baja en materia laboral, fiscal, ambiental, pero también promover justamente bienes públicos regionales y globales, como las vacunas. No puede ser que los países estemos justamente avanzando en, eh, de forma unilateral en un problema que es global. Y en el marco de la conferencia regional, sobre la mujer de América Latina, estamos trabajando junto a las mujeres a nivel regional, impulsando diferentes propuestas para una recuperación transformadora con igualdad en el corto, en mediano y largo plazo. Y es muy importante, y yo creo que esto es una, una contribución que tiene la región hacia el mundo, es que en el marco de esta conferencia, los países acordaron implementar políticas contracíclicas, sensibles a las desigualdades de género, para mitigar los efectos de la crisis en la vida de las mujeres y promover mm, políticas que dinamicen la economía en sectores claves como la economía del cuidado. Esto creo que es 
es, es, es una novedad comparado a los tipos de acuerdos que, que normalmente los gobiernos eh, tenían en el espacio multilateral. Y es una oportunidad para justamente en un contexto que es distinto a las crisis anteriores, porque hay varios países que están impulsa, impulsando paquetes de estímulo fiscal, eh, obviamente con diferencias entre países, incluso dentro de América Latina, este es el momento para evaluar los impactos distributivos de género de estos paquetes de estímulo fiscal y poder justamente avanzar hacia una recuperación que proteja el empleo y los ingresos de las mujeres afectadas por la crisis, pero también promueve acciones afirmativas para que las mujeres también puedan participar en los sectores claves de la recuperación sostenible y que los cuidados realmente sean un driver para la recuperación. No me quiero pasar eh, eh, mucho del tiempo, pero también quería hacer algunas reflexiones sobre esto que decía Mariana de qué es lo nuevo y qué es lo viejo en, en, en estos desafíos que presentamos. Y en la región este, hay tendencias que se están acentuando y que son bastante preocupantes. Una de ellas es la reprimarización exportadora y el aumento de la desigualdad y la pobreza. Entonces, en este contexto, más que nunca, diversificar la estructura productiva y la canasta exportadora en sectores intensivos en conocimiento y en empleo para las mujeres justamente en sectores que puedan contribuir al gran impulso para la sostenibilidad, es fundamental. Y acá precisamos una, un, un avance y un trabajo con los gobiernos más en específico en, 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 en bajarlo a sectores y a cadenas productivas eh, como el turismo sostenible, este, que, que debe ser una, un, un posible sector para dinamizar la economía. Las tensiones geopolíticas eh, y en la reconfiguración de las cadenas globales de valor también está generando un espacio de incertidumbre, incluso las mujeres que participan de forma subordinada en las cadenas globales de valor están viendo eh, afectadas por posibles eh, procesos de reshoring, nearshoring, este, o el proceso de digitalización y automatización. Entonces, de nuevo, la integración productiva regional es otra de las propuestas que desde CEPAL consideramos que tenemos que seguir impulsando este, para poder fomentar encadenamientos productivos, por ejemplo, la industria de manufactura de la salud, donde la región es una importadora neta de los insumos médicos que precisamos justamente para hacer frente a la pandemia. Eh, Ale, ¿estamos bien? No. ¿Cierro por ahí? Sí, sí, puedes. If you, if you can, because it will be a second round for final recommendations. Bueno, dejo esas dos para ahora y, y, y seguimos después con la conversación. Muchas gracias. No, thank you, thank you, Nicole, and I think that many of the things that you were saying uh, it's about Latin America, but it, I, I'm sure that it resonates with uh, the, um, the speakers and the people that we have more than more than 100 people uh, listening to this webinar. And it's exciting, you know, that being such a hard topic, more than 100 people are listening and also putting questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Veda. Sharad Waya, and please apologize if I cannot pronounce your, your surname. Um, she's program officer, a senior program officer on the Hunger Project India, and I'm sure that vast of experience of, you know, what are the challenges, the current challenges, and um, if you can also dialogue with what was said, you know, in terms of the, of the challenges that we have and what you have seen new in this uh, context of pandemia. Welcome, Beda. Thank you, thank you, Alejandra and the fellow panelists. Um, so, um, I think uh, one of the main things which uh, uh, which has and which gets reinforced again and again is that the pandemic certainly exacerbated and visibilized the pre-existing gender inequalities which um, which exist in, uh, in India, and um, um, and it reversed the progress made under uh, different development agendas and, of course, under SDG five. Um, and there were these sea of narratives that really brought this to the forefront. Um, and, um, and another thing which, um, which kind of really did uh, get reinforced for all of us working here, um, um, uh, looking at women's agency and autonomy and voice is, is the kind of normalcy which kind of um, got associated with this kind of a, a glaring inequality which we have seen. Um, There is still no incentive or a value to women's work and something which uh, Professor Ghosh has also mentioned. Um, and, and according to a data, um, and I'm not going to quote too much data because it's all there in the public domain, but according to the data from the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, uh, by November 2020, 49% of total job losses were of women. Um, and this is, of course, uh, remember, this is just women in uh, fewer numbers in the workforce, which is the formal workforce. Um, 
um, participation of female labor force in India is one of the lowest in the world. Um, and another thing, the second thing which, uh, which really stood out during, the, um, during COVID-19, and of course it, it still lingers on the effect of it, is that a, a vast majority of women in India are working in the informal um, workforce. Um, it has really affected the livelihoods and reduced their incomes. And then of course we are looking at the kind of inequalities um, within women in different parts of the country, uh, within women uh, from, the Ura, from the rural to the urban settings. Um, layoffs meant that there was a reversal of migration from small towns and cities um, and a reversal of whatever little financial autonomy that they actually had. Um, and of course, um, it completely restricted their mobility um, and access to public goods. Uh, and, it, and this manifested in different ways. And, uh, and our, my fan, panelists have also raised this um, earlier that you know how there has been an increase in violence against women uh, in care responsibilities, um, uh, in, in unpaid work, um, and also of the girls, because let's not forget that this is a, there's a whole generation of girls um, um, and, and the kind of effect it has on them dropping out of school, on getting married early, uh, and there is no access to gainful employment. Um, I think one of the uniqueness is that, and it keeps coming back, is that um, the measures to tackle COVID did not really account for the gender disparities. Um, the one size fits all approach that the state has um, is, is something which, uh, which really came out. You know, it was usually the stimulus packages was usually devoid of anything specific to counter women's inability and the, and the vulnerabilities that they had. Um, we, of course, acknowledge, um, and this is something which goes on, that we acknowledge the intersecting identities, but our laws, legislations, and policy prescriptions are usually not geared to recognize them. And this is especially seen, and this is just an observation that we've had in our work with the elected women representatives in the village councils um, at the Hunger Project, is that um, especially where you have to see advancing women's and girls' rights are concerned. Um, so, um, and, and, to, and, and one of the main, another thing is that, of course, when you look at autonomy, uh, women's autonomy, it's, a, it's embedded in social norms. So let's not forget in, in, when we're looking at economic autonomy or when you're looking at political economy, uh, autonomy or even social, um, it has brought about several constraints. Um, and, and for instance, in our experience of working with elected women, um, many of these uh, women themselves were members of these collectives at the local level uh, or the self-help groups. Um, now, what the COVID did, of course, during the lockdown, which was introduced, that they meant that they did not have any access to support and solidarity, which we know um, works a lot in really uh, promoting and advancing their agenda. And of course, for them, a, a space for them to deliberate um, um, and to set their agendas forth. Um, so their participation in public life, or, or even as public office holders, or even as members of different collectives, um, it really has become restricted, uh, and, and this is also because uh, she has also uh, had to assume the burden in household responsibilities, which also further increased during the pandemic and which continues to, and the caregiving work. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of put a stop here. Um, um, and of course, coming to the challenges which are there, we all know, um, it just, it's, it's, it's what is startling and which, um, is the kind of normalcy which has got um, associated uh, with, with the, when we keep seeing these inequalities, we keep seeing how it's so glaring. We keep seeing and we keep talking about the narratives in which these women have not had access to uh, public health or services, or even access to say forward linkages in the local market. So for instance, um, in some of the areas that we, uh, that we had visited and, and, and in our experience has been that, they want to work. There are these, they want to, and livelihood opportunities does not necessarily mean that, you know, it's equal to right to work, which is under Manrega, because Manrega, which is the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, that still remains their primary source of whatever little income that they get. Um, and it's not sustainable. So the forward linkages at local level, those are completely missing. And I think during the pandemic, this kind of, it, 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 the inaccessibility only increased further. With the government, you know, the state really, like you cannot have one size and you cannot say, okay, these are the main measures without any sustainable outlook as to how you're really going to push the agenda forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Veda. That was very, um, very interesting also because 
I think coming from my region, uh, not, not many times we hear, you know, what's going on in other parts of the world and, um, and you know, listening from your perspective, what's happening in India, I think that is also, you know, uh, key to see what are the linkages and how to internationalize this movement for, for gender e equality. If, if the issues are more or less the same, you know, um, so I want to give uh, the floor now to Rabin Indrahat Hatari. Uh, some of the issues that we have been mentioning here have to do, you know, from the government's perspective. And so she uh, represents the government of Indonesia. So we have, uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Rabin to tell us, you know, from the perspective, from the government perspective, this, you know, um, from your policy space, how do you see the, co the COVID-19 pandemic impacting women uh, and women's economic autonomy in Indonesia? Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra. Good morning to you all, for those who are in my regions. Um, <laughs> I just realized I'm the only male panelist, right, in this forum. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you so much. Um, so coming back to Alejandra's uh, questions on how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted women's economic autonomy. From our side, from the government, we see this. Coronavirus has affected the working life of just about everyone, right? But then in our studies, we showed that the early evidence showed that it has hit women the hardest, right? Now, this impact of corona pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, fully shows in the private sector side where 90% of Indonesian companies are affected by this pandemic, similar to what happened in other countries, right? Everyone has to bear the burdens of this pandemic. At the state enterprise levels, we also see that similar to the private sector, 90% of our companies shows negative earnings, right? And only 10% of those can maintain business growth. Now, we don't, uh, you know, not to our surprise, the female dominated industry such as tourism has been the hardest hit, right? Airline industries, our airlines, um, uh, state uh, owned airline companies are, are experiencing the, the hardest time of, of their um, time and also the hotels that belongs to our state on enterprise also experience a hard time. In fact, you know, the tourism SOEs are the uh, third largest hit SOE companies, right? Next to male dominated industries such as oil and gas and infrastructure. Further, what we also been informed by UN, uh, the recent studies of UN women's on impact of coronavirus pandemic to Indonesia shows that more than more women than men report a reductions in working hours and 47 percent of women report working from home compared with 35 percent of men the study also shows that the women have suffered higher jobs losses and loss of livelihoods because of their <laughs> overrepresented in sectors and jobs hardest hit by covid so with this background, what the government is saying, okay, what we need to do is we need to help the female workers at two different levels, right? First, what we do is we provide the necessary infrastructures, right? For, for female workers or workers in general to work from home. So the new norm is becoming a key important issues in here. What we do from the government is that from our state under enterprises, we provide um, quotas for internet bandwidth so that they can access their jobs, you know, um, workers can work from homes, um, children can study without any uh, problems from homes with increased bandwidth. Second, what we do is provide also increase on electricity subsidies. We know that the electricity consumption from households during this pandemic time has increased substantially compared to those in the industries where they have wind down because of no operations. So 
we do hope when we design this that this support will help the workers, in particular female workers, who now we see are carrying double duties. Not only right, they're the brand of childcare and education. At the same time, they also have to do their regular jobs. So these facilities are hopes to to support not only workers but most specifically female workers when they work from home. Second, for those informal workers, women, right? given that there's no economic activities, we are providing also cheap credits for them you know, to do their business, to continue their business, or even to restructure right, their businesses. And this is done through our state public sector banks and also uh, with our uh, non-bank financial institution owned by the states. Uh, one way uh, that we see this is um, to provide cheap credits and also to help them to develop skills for post-COVID times. And this is being done not only at the national level, but also at the provincial and local levels. Now, at the micro levels, right, at the enterprise levels, state-owned enterprise sees also this is as an opportunity, right, to improve the workplace as a place that will be conducive for women workers. In fact, a number of our SOE state-owned enterprises are revisiting their HR policies and craft plans to improve gender balances. New HR policy, which are common during pandemic times, such as flexible working hours, are now becoming the standard for Indonesian SOE HR policies. And we wish this new type of policy will continue to become the norm during the post-coronavirus times. That's, so, that's Rabbit, uh, if you could round up, Yes, I think that's 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 the end for me. <laughs> Thank you very much because I think many of the things that you that you mentioned from the experience of Indonesia are 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 is the kind of examples that we would like uh, to end up. You know, in the second part, I think these are precise recommendations that hopefully in different contexts can be replicated. Uh, I want to tell you that there are many questions coming up. Um, from different, uh, from, from, for all of you, but also uh, with different, I have to read them on my, on my WhatsApp, but I think that the, the, the interesting thing that I'm seeing about the question is that some of them are very specific and, and technical, but also, you know, I think that there are people that are newcomers in these debates and they are asking questions about like, what is care economy? right what is this care economy that you are talking about how can i how can you explain it but um let me start with a question for for hayati uh and then hayati you can this is how i'm gonna do it i'm gonna um, mention three questions for three of the panelists and give you the floor okay so these these are questions for hayati mariama and sandra the question for hayati is how can we talk about the economic crisis and new development models built on the basis of women and human rights? So I think that we have been saying this, but maybe um, thinking about people that are engaging for the first times in this, in this debate. Mariama, how do you recommend to implement guiding principles in the action coalitions? I don't know if it was you, Mariama, but also Sandra, I think, mentioned the work. And what do you need to know about um, funding to improve women's economic empowerment efforts in the developing nations? Uh, so I think this question is more about, you know, how do we enthusiast different fi uh, funders and, and, and actors that can fund these policies? And for Sandra, what are your views on how non-Indigenous creators exploiting Indigenous designs, traditions, affect women and their creations? So I think this is also a very particular question. Um, hopefully, um, Hayati, if you want me to also to reiterate the question. No, I've got it. I've got it. And okay. in fact, I'm going to link that with the question on what is the care economy? Because I think the answer is in fact in the care economy. 
the fundamental, I mean, what is the care economy? It is the whole range of activities that involve the care of other people, uh, including those who absolutely cannot take care of themselves, children, elderly people, disabled, sick, but also odd, no, general or normal people who will get various activities performed for them, including unpaid domestic work, housework of all kinds. Now, this care economy is the backbone of our societies. It is the uh, basis on which our economies operate. And yet it is ignored, undervalued, unrecognized. Women are not seen as workers. Women are not who perform most of this unpaid care are not given either social or other recognition. And this has huge implications, not just for the women themselves, but for the fact that capitalist accumulation has been based on exploiting this massive reservoir of unpaid work. And it has created societies that are extremely unequal, but also economies that are not resilient. And I think that's absolutely crucial. The lack of resilience in our economies is a reflection of the fact that our societies and our governments do not value care, do not provide appropriate investment for care, do not ensure that everyone in society has access to care and that those who provide it are treated with respect, remunerated, recognized as workers. So I think all of these issues means we have to fundamentally rethink how we organize our economies because that is the only way these economies will survive. Let's, I think once people understand that, then perhaps there will be a better recognition of the fact that it's no longer just for social justice, it's no longer for gender empowerment, it's no longer for any of these things which ultimately, obviously the men in power don't care about, but it is for the very survival and resilience of economies, which otherwise are very exposed to be collapsing. And I think many of the other things, as Mariama said, the pandemic has to kind of taken an X-ray to all the problems that existed in the current system. But you know, the problems with global food systems, the sheer unsustainability of the ways in which we cultivate, produce, distribute our food, the unsustainability in the patterns of production and consumption, and the lack of recognition of the significance of care in underwriting the formal economy in enabling our societies to survive and acting as a cushion for all kinds of shocks and business cycles and downswings, including in this pandemic and dealing with climate change. I think all of that has to be fundamentally rethought and the care economy and investing in care is absolutely at the heart of it. Thank you, Hayati, thank you. So Mariama, how do you recommend to push for guiding principles in this moment of the gender uh, generation equality forum, but also in this uh, you know, momentum of action coalitions and these processes that are uh, being launched in, within the UN and UN women. Mariama, are you still there? Maybe we lost Mariama. So Sandra, Sandra, oh, Mariama, you are there. Sorry, I'm trying to I unmute see you. myself. I see you. Um, <laughs> so yes, but I, I was saying that I think um, Nicole already started flagging some of the, the, the answers that we need, right? Because I don't think there are any answers to the, the way that the way forward out of this, this um, pandemic in terms of the impact of the economic crisis on women that requires startlingly brilliant answers. I think the answers exist. I think if you look in all of the regional reports from Asia, from Latin America, even Eastern and Central Europe in the, in the preparatory process of Beijing, that they flagged what are the gaps, the implementation gaps that have not occurred as a result of inadequate macro policy, inadequate trade policies and so forth. And Nicole made the point about coherence. So I think that's one of the things that we need to, to really round out is the need for coherence across macro policy, across investment policies. And it's not just about, it's a care economy, but it's also about how you tax, who you tax, what you tax, and protecting the tax base for social 
development the, and for social protection. So I think the question of how we do the globalization, how we look at globalization and rethink it, and Jayati started thinking a little, started to outline some of that, is to interlink the macro policy, the trade policy, the fiscal policies in a way that are grounded in feminist ethos, in, in a, a feminist orientation to economic policy. And I think that the, the head of the Hawaiian Department of Human Services Jabola Carolas said it best. She said, if the plan isn't feminist, it's patriarchal and it will fail to deliver resilient, strong economy. And I think that has to be your basis. When we're talking about building forward or building back or recovery, it has to be grounded in being centered in women's reality, indigenous reality and different ethnic groups, those who are at the base of the society, those who have not, so that our government has to, the key principle has to be providing childcare for all workers, especially those who are deemed essential worker, providing economic security for her small business, in particular those that are MSMEs and female owned. And also we, I think we have to go back to some of the big issues that civil society have been talking about, universal basic income, decent work. I mean, we, these are not new ideas, they're, they're existing. And I think the time is now for us as civil society, what, regardless of where we're advocating, to have a coordinated approach that links and explain how our particular approach, whether we're looking at violence against women or domestic workers, how that links to the macro policy, how that links to trade, how it links to investment. I think the time is past where we can simply organize in our, in, our, in our silos and not interlink these things. And it doesn't require that you become an expert on them. It requires that you link up with groups who are working on it. And it behooves us to really interrogate the economic policies, the fiscal policies. They must be gender sensitive. They must be green or climate friendly. And we need to interlink all of those in our framework, in our thinking through about where we want to go. And we also must link up with grassroots women and men who are doing work on the community, on the, on the, at the base, because they're the ones who are surviving and they have to be the ones who drive, drive whatever we do. So we need to also look at what they're doing, look at how they're responding. So we have to look at the frontline community work that's going on right now in all of our countries where people are struggling because there is no government to give them a stimulus check, a $1,400 stimulus check. Initially, many of our governments did try, in, certainly in the Caribbean, but it's not sustainable. It was not sustainable, especially you're in debt, indebted and also the priorities are skewed in terms of who we want, what sectors. So we'll give the tourist sector money, but we won't give the small business or the own account worker money uh, that is sustainable in the long term. But it's not just us. We see the same debate in the US where you could give a gigantic tax cut to Microsoft, but you debate forever about giving 1400 stimulus to a poor family in Brooklyn or Bronx. So it, it's not a, a, a problem that's unique to us. It's a problem about how we look at the economy and capitalism and the level of solidarity we have, not just across country, but as citizens in each of our countries. And so I think that we, we the principle of course is of course feminist economic policy, um, looking at grounding the care economy and agreeing to promote an economy where you are actually taxing fairly and taxing equitable, the corporation and particularly the digital, digital taxation is a huge big issue now being discussed at OECD. And we have to pay attention to that. We have to ask our tax department, what are their positions on these? How do we get money to build the local communities from the bottom up to build their resilience? for them not just to recover from climate, but to recover from the next disaster. Because there are many disasters waiting in all of our communities, right? So I think a lot of that has to be around um, the fundamental principle of economic gender equality. I know some governments like the Swedish government is proposing that individual tax, you know, how we reform our tax system, how we reform our budgeting system to talk to and to meet the needs of communities. 
many different things, too much for us to talk, and I could come back to it, but I don't <laughs> want to take up too much time on it. But there are many different things that we think, but we have to ground it in the activism on the ground in our community and linking up with the feminist ideals and feminist policy orientation, as well as the activism at different levels of all of us on the global scene. Thank you. Thank you, Mariama. And I don't know if Sandra, you were able to listen to the question about, you know, how in this uh, in these debates of new developments and call it green or calling it whatever, um, the indigenous communities do not get trapped and be instrumentalized, right? And there was a specific question about arts and crafts. Uh, but Sandra, if you want to develop from there about, you know, how not to become instrumentalized in these debates. Okay, I'll answer both questions just quickly. So when it comes to Indigenous women being exploited by non-Indigenous people, what's happened is that, for example, uh, if Indigenous women are doing an artwork that tells their story or what their traditional knowledge is of, you know, because Indigenous people have a oral history of passing things on or also telling through paintings or storylines. So if they, if a tourist comes there and what happens is that they take a photo of a painting and then what happens is then they can go back and they will exploit that painting and say, well, it's beautiful. They can then go to a designer and say, we want to make mats out of this or we want to make towels out of these, these, you know, this picture that we've done. And then that's, and that has actually happened over here in Australia where someone done that. And then they made a lot of money. So, you know, they're generating an income or, and exploiting our, our traditional knowledge. And that story was, has, had a meaning. It had a foundation to what that community was about. And that's, that's a lot of our, in a lot of our arts and craft work and in our weaving and everything, everything comes with the story. But we're being exploited through technology and, and, and through, we don't have the funds to go to, a, to somebody to print and to make you know, huge big mats and everything like that. We are not financially secure in those spaces. And, you know, it's really exploiting us. And so it keeps us in poverty. And we don't know what is really out there now with technology and everything. And some of our Indigenous peoples on our communities don't even have technology. So they don't know how much they are being exploited. And I just want to get back to you. This is why it's important that states obligate the international human rights law and protect us, and this is one way of when we're putting in um, the the uh, the um, uh, the UN uh, pres uh, business and human rights principles. And by that is that you know it's about educating, and this is what I know. What FEMI do is through education is is saying, look, you know, you also have a free prime form consent. Nobody can come into your village without exploiting you. You know, we've got to really get that information out about exploitation, but also about our rights of free prior informed consent and about what the, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights can do. And one of those principles, as I said, one of those main things is about remedy. And we've got to take things to court. We may not have the finance, but you know, there are pro bono lawyers out there who can take court cases to court. Indigenous people never had nothing, but you know, we're continually like with FEMI being at the table, uh, writing interventions into the UN, but also looking at how we can use some of our lawyers, and I'm a lawyer myself, taking things to court to seek remedies throughout through the human rights guiding principles. And by continually doing these things and making challenges, you know, it opens up the door for information. It opens up precedents that we can set when we challenge something in the courtroom, uh, it can seek good remedies for Indigenous women, and it can also move them towards self-determination and, and empowering them. And I say to our Indigenous women many times, you know, we've got to take the challenge up, especially in the legal system. We may lose sometimes, but we may win. And that's the point of doing all of this all of the time. And as we go back to, you know, looking at the remedies that we can seek in the Western system of the, of the legal system. So, you know, that expert, expert uh, you know, being exploited is huge. But, you know, we've got to make information sharing and caring and, and looking after and providing the right information to our women to seek remedies, especially under that, because states have an obligation 
um, and even though they may not meet those obligations under UN guiding principles on business and human rights, you know, they still have, there are third parties and those are business enterprise they still have that obligation. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Um, so for Veda, and I think that also many of you touched on the issue of migration and vulnerable and, the, and some groups that are more vulnerable than others, but specifically to you, Veda, how, how do you see, um, if, you can, if you can explore more or uh, yeah, explain a little bit more about the linkages for the women that are you know, more vulnerable in this situation, how it was for them, what are the, um, what are the mechanisms that make uh, them uh, go through this situation of pandemia better? And especially um, one of the questions that was raised and not just to you, Vera, but what happens when we are talking about migration, right? And most of these immigrants are also illegal in some parts of the of the world, and they are not sitting at the at these tables at these discussions. I, I don't know how many of, of the people here in this discussion are migrants themselves to be responding to this question. But if you can bear that, uh, maybe your organization has been working a little bit more on how to tap on the specificities or, of being a migrant woman, a migrant child in this context of pandemia? Sure, um, so where, uh, where linkages for women is concerned, um, one of the things that we've observed is that um, if you move away from the formal processes of the state and the institution, it's in the informal spaces where women have really uh, um, tried to, you know, um, uh, come forth and actually access because I think it gives the freedom and the flexibility for them to really, um, and also accessibility for them. So um, I think um, the, 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 the use of informal spaces at the local level uh, in close proximity to the communities that they belong to um, really does help in really getting um, uh, people together and really getting women together to really have a safe space for them. And this is something that we've observed uh, during the pandemic as well. Um, and, um, and secondly, um, about migration, I think um, um, at least in our experience, it's more been about the returning migrants who were coming back. Um, and we saw how um, these women, and especially the women who've been elected to, um, to the village councils, because there is a quota of seats for women to contest elections in village councils. Um, there are two things which stood out. One is that there was, a, there was um, this restlessness and this anger that, um, that was coming forth from the migrants who were returning back. Um, the, the restlessness was that in, in terms of the information asymmetry, which was taking place. Um, and it's not about the, the the lack of information, but it's just in terms of the hyperbole of information that was coming forth. Um, and, and how these women really, um, I mean, it was a struggle, it was a challenge because um, uh, you know that lack of information vis-a-vis -vis misinformation, that's even another kind of challenge altogether. So how these women really tackle that, you know, at the local level and being public office holders, there was also rising expectations from them to deliver goods and to deliver fast. Um, even if the stimulus packages that were coming through uh, were really slow, or it, it was in fact uh, the different beneficiaries that needed to, to, to be identified. So I think one of the learnings has to be that, um, A, that, that the, 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 there needs to be a convergence between different departments and different uh, uh, actors at play, uh, when you're, especially when you're looking at service provisioning at the local level. And secondly, where women and girls' rights are concerned, um, and, and where migration is concerned, a lot of them, when we look at closure of schools, um, it, it, uh, there needs to be a universality in terms of the access that they can get. So even if a migrant is from one particular state, going to another particular state is something that um, um, it's, it's not something that cannot be realized, cannot be achieved, but there needs to be a portability factor there. Um, um, because this is, I mean, it is unusual times and this was the pandemic, which none of us foresee, um, but it really broke down the system, so to speak, but it also brought to the forefront some of the leadership that these women exercised um, uh, and the kind of challenges that they face. So, so that's all uh, I have to add. No, thank you. Thank you, Veda, for that. Nicole, there was one question for you um, about this issue of, of care, but specifically on um, co-responsibility between uh, women and men and how, how to advance, you know, uh, sharing responsibilities, uh, especially at the level of, you know, the, in, in, of partners, right? So the question was more about that because you especially tapped on, on care and, and 
co-responsibilities is, is one aspect. If you can tell us more about that. Sí, desde CEPAL nosotros consideramos la corresponsabilidad eh, como, un, como una corresponsabilidad que tiene que ser entre hombres y mujeres, entre diversas formas de familia, pero también entre el Estado, el mercado y las comunidades. Y por eso hablamos de corresponsabilidad social también de los cuidados y avanzar hacia una redistribución eh, y una orga, justa organización social eh, de los cuidados. Este, en, en, en el marco de la Conferencia Regional sobre la Mujer de América Latina y el Caribe, los gobiernos aprobaron la, una estrategia, la estrategia Montevideo, que tiene como objetivo justamente acelerar la implementación de la plataforma de acción de Beijing, acelerar la, la implementación de los compromisos asumidos eh, en el marco de la conferencia regional que forman parte de esta agenda regional de género, donde por ejemplo el derecho al cuidado es un derecho que ha estado establecido en, en el marco de estos acuerdos hace más de una década en el consenso de Quito, que luego ha funcionado, ha servido como como paraguas para a nivel nacional impulsar justamente sistemas integrales de cuidados o políticas de cuidados y fomentar eh, la corresponsabilidad. Este, lo que hemos identificado en CEPAL, que en, en estas últimas décadas, si bien ha habido una incorporación de las mujeres al mercado laboral, aunque después obviamente se ha estancado en torno a un 50%, y ahora vemos un retroceso, este, este proceso de incorporación de las mujeres al mercado laboral no fue acompañado por un proceso de incorporación de los hombres al trabajo de, de no remunerado y de cuidado dentro de los hogares. Y esto ha generado una sobrecarga de trabajo en las mujeres que en el Observatorio de Igualdad de Género de América Latina y el Caribe tenemos indicadores específicos para justamente monitorear y, 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 y poder reportar este, cómo está esta situación donde las mujeres dedican tres veces más del tiempo que los hombres a, a las tareas de trabajo no remunerado de cuidados, y donde también medimos la carga total del trabajo, porque justamente frente a la ausencia de corresponsabilidad, las mujeres tienen una doble, una triple jornada, este, cuando sumamos la carga de trabajo remunerado más el trabajo no remunerado. Entonces, si bien eh, impulsamos la importancia de, de adoptar marcos normativos, este, políticas específicas de, para avanzar sistemas de cuidados, un, una, una acción fundamental es justamente poder cambiar los patrones eh, eh, culturales patriarcales, discriminatorios y violentos que sustentan esta ideología de que las mujeres son las principales cuidadoras y que impiden este, realmente que las políticas puedan implementarse eh, en una sociedad que vaya avanzando hacia una corresponsabilidad y donde los hombres vayan asumiendo cada vez más estas, eh, estas tareas que, que son claves para el sostenimiento de la vida y para el funcionamiento de, de las economías. También vi una pregunta que hablaba sobre la valorización económica del trabajo no remunerado. Bueno, en América Latina, desde la CEPAL, hemos acompañado a muchos países de la región en esta valoración económica, que en algunos países alcanza hasta un 20, un 25% del PBI. Este, pero esas herramientas de, 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 de poder mostrar este, la, la implicancia macroeconómica del trabajo no remunerado de cuidados, si bien venía de una... Eh, digamos, una recomendación de la Plataforma de Acción de Beijing, y desde América Latina lo hemos avanzado y lo hemos impulsado fuertemente, todavía no ha sido suficiente para hacer este cambio que, que estamos pidiendo de poder eh, contemplar la dimensión macroeconómica de este trabajo, y, y, y creo que bueno, el contexto de la recuperación con igualdad este, y, y del acuerdo de los gobiernos de avanzar en la, en, en, en la inversión en la, en la economía del cuidado como un sector eh, de la economía, eh, para, y, y medir los efectos multiplicadores, que fue otro de los acuerdos que, que se aprobaron en el marco de la conferencia, para ver los efectos multiplicadores de, del cuidado en el bienestar, en la reducción de la desigualdad, eh, incluso hasta en el crecimiento económico, eh, nos parece que, que, que nos dan elementos ahora para, para ver si luego de 26 años de esta recomendación de Beijing, podemos asegurar que más países avancen en la valoración de, de, del trabajo no remunerado y de cuidados, y podamos dar este salto que requerimos de, de que sea efectivamente contemplado en el análisis macroeconómico y en las respuestas a la crisis. Gracias. Uh, thank, thank you very much. We, we are also uh, receiving more questions and, and thank you, Nicole, also for being, um, being looking at the chat. Um, 
there are, there are more questions and I really want uh, to, to comment uh, you and women to really register because I think that there are comments that are interesting uh, for you and women also to register as you know provocations but also as issues that can be important in terms of what what are the groups demanding in terms of information especially there are many questions about resources you know where where are the resources that can stimulate these these advances or these facts or policies that you are discussing here. So we are almost closing the the, the meeting today, this panel. And I uh, the idea is to have you panelists uh, saying one recommendation, right? One of the things is not just to tap on the challenges that, as Mariama and Hayati and many of you were saying, are not new. They can have a different pitch, they can be accelerated, but these challenges have been here, they are structural and, um, and have been here for a while. But what are the recommendations? Because it's fundamental for, for, for this type of forum that has many actors involved, not just civil society or governments, but also other actors, UN agencies, but also private sector involved in some parts of the, of the debate. What are the recommendations? If you were to, you know, in this limited time, uh, give us one example or two um, of one, one, what, what are the things that you think are, you know, like backbones, as you said, Hayati, the care economy. But um, apart from that, what could be um, that final message in terms of recommendations? And maybe I can start um, from instead of. Or I can, yeah, I can ask Hayati or Maya or Mariama, who were the first speaker in this panel, if you were to tell us one recommendation or two. Mariama. Mariama. All right. Good morning. Yes, Mariama. <laughs> Again, I keep unmuting myself. Well. For me, a number of things, right? So we know we have started out by saying that the pandemic has shown this kind of inextricably intertwined with policy decision making and the ripple effect of that to the economy and in particular care economy and women's, women, girls and boys and men's life. Um, so if, we, if we're gonna retool the global economy, right? I think it must occur in a framework where we are pushing to preserve and uphold civil, economic and political rights in a context of just transitions. And the just transitions, I think, are not just about climate. It's also about the just transition in the response to the post-COVID recovery. And that must include issues of redressing historical wrongs, such as reparations for slavery, colonialism, and the rights of indigenous men and women. Um, for me, a central thing is that we must organize around uh, a basic global minimum wage and or universal basic income. And as part of a new global contract, so it cannot be an indi individual country, it has to be a global orientation. So that's at a global level. I think in terms of our countries, I think our governments must commit to responsible and re responsible and re receptive financial taxation, including revenue tax loopholes, um, to get funds into community groups, community-based community, those are on the front line, and for women's project, and that includes redirecting also whatever climate finance is available into those of women who were on the ground dealing with these disasters, including COVID. Yeah, thank you, Mariama, because you tapped right on the finance issue. That was, you know, one, one of the interests uh, among the, the people in this panel. Hayati, are you ready with your one or two, can be global recommendations, but also as Mariama was saying, maybe tapping on, on national level too. Uh, Ale, Jayati dropped off, so I, I oh, think- Oh, okay. Else. So maybe Carmen, or Vera? Sandra sure, um, or Vera? Sandra? Yeah, sure. I'll, okay. 
should i yeah so yes, um i think um, i think to uh, to start with uh, the depoliticization of the beijing um, agenda which has happened um i think we need to really uh, revisit and relook at that and also which in effect means that you know we look at 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 promoting and advancing women's rights in its entirety um and um, uh, and as mariana mentioned that yes um we really need to sometimes get the role of ideas in policy so we really need to get these conversations that are happening um um, um take it back make it simplified and make it into a national narrative so to speak um, and how do we do that is by deconstructing it and taking it back to the communities that we work with um and also kind of make it more simple and i will only end with one thing one is that um we have seen and this is something which also the pandemic it really stood out is that when you strengthen women's leadership it really does help in challenging the norms which are there uh you need to get more women in decision making you need to get more women in public offices and spaces um because we've seen that you know how these development and whatever challenges there are there in the development and in the democratic narratives these women have played their part and of course you 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 arm them with the necessary skills and knowledge um and this really goes a long way in advancing the agenda that we've all been talking about uh in our respective contexts so yeah thank you thank you veda thank you veda for tapping again on what made us come together here, Beijing, right? The Beijing platform. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra? Yes, I agree uh, with what, what Veda said. I think that what's happened is that they need to go back and have a look at the, um, the Beijing uh, Declaration and Platform for Action and have a look at what uh, FEMI and other Indigenous groups have put in through their recommendations for that. Uh, in, and one of the other recommendations is that all women need to be at the table. We need to have all different women sitting at the table. You know, we have so many men sitting out there and I think that, uh, you know, with the sustainable development uh, goals, you know, leave nobody behind. They must remember that we are being left behind. We need to have, uh, there should be a percentage of women sitting at the table when there's changes to any policy makers or any laws that are put in place, especially at the UN level. Because if you start at the top, you can always bring things down, but we need to be at the table. And I think that it, they need to go back and have a look at all the studies that have been compiled, especially through uh, FEMI with, when we prepared all our reports uh, to have a look at implementing some of our recommendations through the Beijing uh, Declaration and Platform for Action. Um, I'd just quickly like to thank you all again for listening and especially uh, to FEMI, to the National Aboriginal Women's Alliance, UN Women, and to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Nicole, are you ready? Yes? Sí, es una recomendación con tres partes eh, que estamos impulsando en el marco de la Conferencia Regional sobre la Mujer de América Latina y el Caribe con bueno, mujeres, con los no, movimientos de, de mujeres y feministas de la región, eh, con los distintos gobiernos, y, y bueno, creo que es fundamental impulsar un pacto fiscal y de género que pueda contribuir de forma simultánea a la reactivación económica, pero que esta recuperación sea con igualdad y que sea transformadora. Por eso desde CEPAN no hablamos de Build Back Better o o porque no tenemos nada a dónde volver, no podemos reconstruir el pasado que ya era profundamente discriminatorio y desigual. Entonces, esta recomendación tiene tres eh, aristas. Una es aumentar los ingresos, y tenemos que mejorar la recaudación de forma progresiva, poder combatir los flujos financieros ilícitos, poder este, ampliar el espacio fiscal eh, grabando la riqueza que, es, que existe en la región poder avanzar en, en asignar en la, la parte de gastos, poder asignar los recursos suficientes a las políticas de igualdad de género clave en el contexto de la pandemia. Servicios de salud sexual y reproductiva, servicios de cuidado, poder expandir la cobertura de los instrumentos de protección social. Y finalmente, pensar la inversión. ¿Cómo vamos a promover paquetes de estímulo fiscal que estén orientados a proteger justamente los ingresos de las mujeres y su plena participación en la reactivación? Y esto, obviamente, en un marco de cooperación regional e internacional para una justicia de género y tributaria. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Nicole. That was straightforward. Um, I don't know if Hayati is on, but I also want to give the floor to Rabin from Indonesia. You were already engaging in that. 
strategy and recommendations, right? Yes. Um, so thank you. I think quickly uh, on the recommendations, promoting women leaderships and I think exercising women empowerment is a key. How to do that from a policy angles, the government needs to introduce policy that will uh, encourage for more of this gender mainstreaming. But however, I think the development of this policy needs also to be supported by a community based inputs. And I think this is in line with what Veda was mentioning. The importance of out? community based inputs uh, to the policy making is clearly is important. As such, in the Ministry of SOE, we're happy to, to, sh to share in here that for the first times, we have the first uh, community based women of SOEs. So what we hope in the future is we will work together with this community, Srikandi, where they provide us with inputs on how to improve our policies, particularly on in, uh, promoting more women leadership and exercising women empowerment. So this needs to be this two sides of, of, of the coins, you know, policy from the government sides, but the government cannot make a great pol good policy without inputs from the communities. Thank you. Thank you, Rabin. Uh, Nancy, I'm not sure if uh, Hayati is back. No, she is not. I think no, you can wrap up. I... Okay, Sorry. so um, I, I, I'm not gonna dare to do any kind of summary. I think that um, uh, you have been saying lots of things that it's very difficult to summarize and hopefully UN Women is gonna also to upload this video. Um, in the YouTube channel, Facebook channel for everyone to re-listen to the amazing amount of knowledge and experience. Um, there has been a lot of being shared that, that is, you know, that resonates in every region when you talked about, you know, specific agendas to promote in terms of decent, uh, decent jobs, in terms of the basic income, um, in terms of putting at the center the most vulnerable groups of raising uh, income and, and, and also financing for this policy um, still resonates in, in, in my mind when um, Hayati and Mariana were saying, we have not changed, you know, it's not that different from where we were when we celebrated the, the, the Beijing uh, platform for action in 1995. But also at the same time, you all depicted different dimensions about, you know, the growth, the acceleration of some of these changes, the, the erosion of certain rights, the, um, the lack of internationalization, even in, in this time of pandemic, um, certain specific responses from the territories that have been uh, fundamental for the survival of the people on the ground. So many of the things that you have been saying talk about, you know, revisiting Beijing from what is what is happening now at local level. We cannot look at Beijing with, you know, the, the glasses, the lenses that we had in 1995, because many things have also changed. Um, I think that for the purpose of the Generation Equality Forum uh, and the global messages that uh, are needed, um, the, I think that you all talked about the climate change agenda, the labor agenda, all the rich uh, knowledge coming from the feminist economic analysis, from diverse feminist movements, LGBT communities, migrant communities that should be at the center of the responses, the participation of all these diverse groups should be at the center of this discussion of recovery for whom and how, right? So, um, I, I don't want to, to say nothing more, but hopefully hopefully all these recommendations um, are enriched uh, through the, the coming days. And I don't know if Nancy, that you have been at the backstage, if you want to give some closing uh, to this session and how people can still listen to the, to the debates tomorrow and until the 31st. Thank you, everyone. I think we just welcome you to also check out days two and three of the forum and then also to see you in Paris as we now launch uh, the kickoff to commitments um, where we're really looking for ambitious and game changing commitments and actions. And we're taking all of these recommendations into day two tomorrow in the action uh, day. So I, I really thank you all.
um, and huge thanks while we uh, have been working on the technical uh, difficulties on, on the back end. Uh, thank you for the patience. With um, yes, and good night. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.